Good evening, everyone. Happy to have you here this evening as we um, start to like move into the Sabbath hours. Tonight, we are going to study the book of Habakkuk. So I invite you to bow your heads and we'll open up with a word of prayer and then we'll dig right in. in. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day, this end to this week. We thank you for the many blessings through the week. Lord, as the Sabbath hours open, we pray and ask for your presence, that you may be with us as we worship you, that you would touch our hearts and give us that humble and open spirit that you desire, Lord, the one that you can work with. Father, forgive our sins, and um, please, for each one of us, we, for, for the areas where we are weak, please make us strong. Please um, convict us of things we don't know. And, and help us just to be um, a walking testimony of you, Lord. As we open up this book, we ask that you would um, shine the light on the areas that are needful for us to understand in these end times that we live in, and that we will learn the lessons of the past, Lord, for indeed they do apply for us today. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as we uh, get started here, the first thing I want to do is mention that the references that are in the materials here are the King James Version of the Bible, the SDA Bible Commentary, A Guide to the Prophets by Stephen Winward, Prophets and Kings by Ellen White, and Sabbath School Lesson Quarterly 1963. Funny how, funny how truth doesn't change. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead. We're going to... Yeah. So we are going to open up with an introduction. We're starting a new book, so we want to get some background historical perspective on the book before we jump into the verses. So uh, first of all, the title. The title of this book, like those of the other minor prophets, is simply the name of the author, Habakkuk, Hebrew for Chebekwek is derived from the verb chabak, or to embrace. Some have connected the name with the Akkadian hambakik, the name of an aromatic garden plant. The name Habakkuk occurs nowhere else in the Old Testament. So no doubt I am not quite pronouncing those right, but um, it, is an, it is interesting to, to know that this prophet's name, it means uh, to embrace which is very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so the authorship. Nothing is known concerning the prophet Habakkuk beyond his name. Whether, like Amos, Habakkuk was called by God from some other occupation, or whether he was specially trained for his calling in the schools of the prophets, it's not recorded. It is possible that he was a temple singer, since his third chapter is dedicated to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Although no chronological data are found in the book, certain statements permit a comparatively exact dating of Habakkuk's prophecies. The temple is mentioned as still existing, which shows that the book was written before Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. Furthermore, the rise of the Chaldeans and their invasion of the West is predicted, but this seemed at the time completely incredible. The situation fits best, the time period, pr time prior to the rise of the Chaldean Empire under Nabopolassar, who began the reign in 626 and 625 BC, and who, with the Medes, was responsible for the destruction of Assyria, a date possibly about 630 BC, but before the Chaldeans had become a power of some importance would seem most appropriate for the period of Habakkuk's prophetic activity. Okay, historical setting. It appears that this book was written during a time of deep apostasy. And um, at some point, if you want to go to Prophets and Kings and read a little bit more deeper about that, there's a reference there. So it's probably sometime during the latter part of the reign of Manasseh, during the reign of Ammon, or during the first part of the reign of Josiah. It seems most likely that the ministry of Habakkuk followed rather closely the ministry of the prophet Nahum. 
This view is favored by the position of the book in both the Hebrew and the Greek canon. The evils in general that Habakkuk attributes to his people and of which he complains also point to this period. The prophet well knew the crisis that Babylon was soon to bring upon his people because of their sins, a crisis that would result finally in the captivity of Judah. Habakkuk forewarned the nation of this crisis and also predicted the divine judgment upon adulterous and iniquitous Babylon, the enemy of God and his people. All right, so the theme. Though Habakkuk regrets Judah's sins and knows that his people deserve punishment, he is concerned about the outcomes of their afflictions. He is concerned also about the destiny of the instrument God uses to inflict the punishment, the Chaldeans, who seem to be blessed and increasing prosperity. God responds to his servant's questioning heart and shows Habakkuk that the chastening of the Israelites for their ultimate, was, is for their ultimate good, while the earthly prosperity of the wicked, represented by Babylon, will pass away because of di divine judgment. In the prayer of chapter 3, this book is climaxed by a graphic depiction of the doom of the ungodly and the triumphant reward of the righteous. In this contrast, it is God's purpose to reveal to the prophet how the swelling pride of the Chaldeans and likewise that of the all wicked leads to death, while the trustful submission of the righteous to God through faith leads to life. In this emphasis upon holiness and faith, Habakkuk takes his place with Isaiah as a gospel prophet. The book of Habakkuk provides a solution to the problem of why God permits sinners to flourish, comparable to the solution provided by the book of Job to the problem of why God permits saints to suffer. Habakkuk sincerely loved the Lord and earnestly longed for the triumph of righteousness, but he could not understand why God seemingly permitted the apostasy and crime of Judah to go unchecked and unpunished. God informs him that he has a plan for checking and punishing Judah for its evil ways and that the Chaldeans are to be the instrument by which he will accomplish this plan. This explanation gives rise to another problem in Habakkuk's mind. How can God use a nation more wicked than Judah to punish Judah? How can such a plan be reconciled with divine judgment? So we don't always understand how God acts or why he acts. Um, you know, that's, we are, 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 we are just told to trust because he always has the best interest of his people in mind. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Manasseh, though, I'm not sure the Chaldeans were actually more evil than him. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is very true, sadly to say. Okay, so continuing on, rashly yet in all earnestness and innocence, Habakkuk's demands an answer from God. Momentarily passing by the rashness of Habakkuk's demand, God assures the prophet of the certainty of his purpose with respect to Judah and then points out to Habakkuk his need for humility and faith. God proceeds to enumerate the sins of Babylon. He is fully aware of the treachery and the wickedness of Babylon and assures Habakkuk that he, God, is still in control of the affairs of the earth. Accordingly, all men, including Habakkuk, would do well to keep silence before him. That is not a question, the wisdom of his, that is to not question the wisdom of his ways. So, you know, when, when he, I, I thought about this as I was studying, I'm like, how similar to us today? Right, um, you know, God does ask us to come and, you know, have have a conversation with Him and ask Him and, you know, and and um, question these things with Him. But yet, you know, there comes a point where God has to say, "I'm not going to reveal it all to you. You just have to trust." And that's really what He was telling Habakkuk here: is that I'm still in control. You may not understand this. I'm revealing to you what I'm going to do. In time, it will be understood, but please trust. Right. He's almost having an Abraham moment. 
on yes. Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. How about this thing? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. exactly. It is hard, though, just to wait yeah. and not knowing. It's very and hard. Even Isaac, you know, wait 20, 20 years to get to uh -huh. Jacob. And, I mean, can That's you right. believe it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. in the meantime, yeah. you don't know. But, you know, we read the Sabbath school like two weeks ago. It says that the faith of Jesus, mm -hmm. that strong that we need. The exactly. Of the faith of Jesus, not knowing, believe, not seeing. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, so realizing that he has overstepped the bounds of propriety by uh, presuming to challenge the divine wisdom and will, Habakkuk humbly repents. In the same breath, however, his earnest, devoted concern about Judah as the chosen instrument of God's plan on earth leads to the plea that divine justice will be seasoned with mercy. This prayer is followed by a revelation of divine glory and power which shows God at work for the salvation of his faithful ones and for the overthrow of their foes. The book closes with Habakkuk's affirmation of confidence in the wisdom and eventual success of the divine plan. Okay. All right, so I, I did provide you an outline there. Um, you can use that as your reference point when you come back and study you know, on your own and, and more deeply. But essentially, there's three sections separated in, into three different chapters. So the first one is, you know, talking about the problem, which is all this apostasy going on and, and Habakkuk complaining to God. It's, it's almost like, God, we've been, you know, we have been complaining to you about this for so long. When are you going to step in? And this is the human perspective, right? You know, because God doesn't see time like we see time. God is just in what he does, and he allows evil to exist to run its course because he is a just and gracious God, and he not, wants no one to not come to an understanding of him. So he's very patient. We don't have that kind of patience. We see things in a very you know, narrow time um, perspective. And mm -hmm. God sees it from the beginning to the end. From yes, the beginning does. when Satan rebelled in, in, or Lucifer in heaven to the very end when there will never be sin again because everyone will look back and see just how bad it really was. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The only human is not complaining. It's only Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Even John the Baptist. Are you that one? That I'm wearing? Yeah. Okay, so the middle section is the solution. God talks about the solution. And then at the third section of it is Habakkuk's response to all that God reveals to him. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into this chapter here. Chapter 1, the prophet's question, verses 1 through 4. Who would like to read that for me? The burden which Habakkuk, um, the prophet, did see... O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Okay. Who is Habakkuk talking about here? Judah. He's talking about Judah. So he's talking about the fact that the wicked in Judas encompass around those that are righteous. So if you think back to the time of Elijah... And they had the, situation, the same situation, right? So they had a very apostate king on the throne, and most of the nation went the direction of that king, and there were very few who were righteous. And um, Elijah didn't even know that there were righteous people around. He thought they had all been killed off. Um, so this was a similar condition going on here in Habakkuk's time. So what conditions does Habakkuk see in Judah? What is he complaining about here to God? The burden. 
Yeah, he has a burden, right? But he has a burden because there's so much evil amongst God's people, right? Yeah. yeah. So these are supposed to be God's people. They're supposed to be upholding God's law and a testament to the nations around them, and he's seen that there's so much evil amongst them. Yeah, and we, we, we see this theme throughout, throughout the, Old, uh, the Old Testament and certainly the Minor Prophets, yeah. whether it's Amos or or any of the Old Testaments that we've already studied, there is that desire to tell the Lord they're doing wrong and this is what they're doing. Yeah. And they have this desire to tell the people, listen, repent, because this is the problem. Yeah. So I think we see it here. I agree. Likewise. And they identify the problem. It's just not, you know, what's wrong with you? This is what you do every day. Yeah. Well, and you look, the people usually follow the king. I know Manasseh, not only did he burn children in the fire, set up pagan altars in the temple, yeah. um, etc. And yet God still ultimately had him led by a nose ring and a brass chain to Babylon to go to jail. Yeah. But he repented and got... So you can be that bad and still repent. And that is the amazing thing. God is so gracious and merciful. Boy, right? And he does not judge as we do. So... Praise the Lord for that. That's it. And you saw the prophets in half and various things. So the people have to be just horribly paganized right now. Yes. I would say that is the condition. And, and, it, and it weighs on Habakkuk, right? So going into that discussion there, the burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. That Hebrew word is masa, which is an utterance or a load, technically oracle or solemn message. So he was feeling the burden of what was going on and the Lord was going to give him a revelation about this, right? And so we see this in, in many of the prophets in, in the Old Testament um, that before, they, before God reveals to them what he's going to do, they have a deep sense of sorrow and burden and repentance and then God steps in, right? This isn't the first time that Habakkuk prayed about this. It probably had been going on for decades that he's been praying. Yeah. So um, the word prophet there, um, the other minor prophets, of all, all of them, only Haggai and Zechariah claim themselves a title of prophet, which is very interesting. Okay. All right, so page four, verse two. He says to the Lord, how long shall I cry? So in, in saying that, the prophet was greatly distressed on account of his people's sinfulness and the results certain to follow. From the language he employs, it seems that Habakkuk had brought his perplexity to God for some time, and yet God did not hear. That is, he apparently did nothing to stop the evils of Judah. Habakkuk implies he is more interested in righteousness and justice than God appears to be. Right. That's the human perspective. Okay, so I cry unto you of this violence. So that's violence is Hebrew shamas, or wrongs in general. It's not necessarily involving the infliction of bodily harm upon one another, like the English word suggests. And um, verse 3 says, Why do you show me this iniquity and cause me to uphold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me. So spoiling, that Hebrew word is shod, or violence or devastation, which often refers to destruction by plundering. And uh, so anyway, it's not just a bodily, but we're, we're going to see that it's more around how they, everything they do when they interact with other, each other is corrupt and for their own gain. Verse 4, therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. So the law there is a Hebrew Torah, which is a term inclusive of the revealed will of God. So in Deuteronomy 31.9, we read, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord and unto all the elders of Israel. And in Proverbs 3.1, it says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. So it's, it's God's law he's talking about. God's law is slacked. That word slacked is Hebrew pug, or to grow numb. 
The prophet attributed the paralyzing of the law's effectiveness among the inhabitants of Judah to God's failure to stop this iniquity. So in other words, God, if you had only stepped in, it wouldn't have gotten this bad, is what he's saying. Um, the word for slacked in the Septuagint is frustrated. However, the Hebrew reading of the Masoretic text is confirmed by the reading of the Hebrew text quoted in the recently discovered Habakkuk commentary of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that seems to more, lean more towards the, um, the translation of to grow numb. And then it says, the wicked doth come pass about the righteous. So that word is to surround the evil with evil intent. As a result, the righteous are victimized by the wicked, and judgment is rested and perverted in its relation to them. Now, example there in Psalms 22, 12, and 13, it says, Many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as ravening and roaring lions. Okay? And the word judgment there is or justice. So he's saying because of their evil and it surrounds us and it, you know, overcomes us, there is no judgment. There is no justice. Okay, so verse 5 then. Uh, let's read verses 5 through 11 for the next session. This is the Lord's reply to Habakkuk's complaint. Victor, would you like to read this? Yep, I can do that. Verse 5, Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it, it, though it be told you. For lo, I raise, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall mer march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And the horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from afar. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall set up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity of the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall eat dust and take it. Then shall his mind change. And he shall pass over and offend, imputing this is power and to his goal is God. Okay. So because of Judah's sin, then what what punishment or scourge is gonna befall them? Yeah. It's gonna be this evil nation, right? right. Yep. It's gonna take them into captivity is, is what's gonna happen. So it says, in reply to his complaint, the prophet is told that the Lord is about to do a new and surprising thing. He is raising up the Chaldeans to be the instrument of his justice on the wicked Judeans. Nabopolassar, who established a Neo-Babylonian empire, came from Chaldea, a province of southern Babylonia. That is why the Babylonians are called the Chaldeans. They are described as hard and cruel, their horsemen are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves, and they swoop on the prey like a vulture. Intent on plunder and captives, they scorn kings and fortified cities. Their own strength is their God, yet these Chaldeans are the instrument of God's judgment and chastisement. Okay, so let's talk about those texts a little bit more in depth. It says, so in verse 5, it says, Behold, ye among the heathen. Among the heathen there, God proceeds to answer the prophet's complaint. He charges Habakkuk to look among the surrounding nations for the one that God will use to punish his people for their sins. The Septuagint begins this verse with saying, Behold, ye despisers, which rendering... Paul quotes in Acts 13, 41. 
And it says, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days. So wonder marvelously, when God's punishment comes suddenly, it will strike terror into the hearts. This really, you know, and in, in when I was reading through this, this is, to me is just sounds just like the end times, right? And, and then God talks about the terror that men will face when, when Christ comes again. And uh, says, and I will work it in your days. So since Habakkuk had asked how long this iniquity be, permitted to continue, the Lord assures him that the divine wrath will come in the time of those then living. So it wasn't some far distant thing. It was going to happen within their lifetime. And then he says, which you will not believe. So you're going to be astounded by this, in other words. It's an indication of the severity of the coming judgment. <laughs> Verse 6 says, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. So we talked a little bit about that group. The Hebrew root custom, um, you can read more on that in, in Daniel 1.4. It's the nation of Babylon, which is now revealed as the agent of divine anger, whom God will raise up to serve his purpose. The term Akidim or Kaldu designates the members of an Armenian tribe whose early settlement was in lower Mesopotamia and who had taken over the rulership of Babylonia when Nabopolassar founded the Neo-Babylon dynasty. And so he calls them a bitter and hasty nation. So why hasty? The Hebrew uh, word there is nimhar or impetuous. This foretells the rapid movement of Babylonian conquest, aptly represented by the figure of the eagle's wings of Daniel's prophecy. So in Daniel 7, 4, um, it says lion and eagle's wings, and that's an appropriate symbol for Babylon. The winged lion is found on Babylonian objects of art. The combination of lion and eagle was a common motif, more often a lion with eagle's wings sometimes with claws or a beak. A similar composite was the eagle with a lion's head. The winged lion is one of the forms of the beast, which is pictured in combat with Marduk, the patron god of the city of Babylon. On these lion-eagle combinations, see, and then there's a reference there. You can go look if you want to read more and see some of the figures for them. I didn't put them in here. Okay. So other prophets referred to King Nebuchadnezzar by similar figures. So you can go in and read some uh, verses in Jeremiah and Lamentations and Ezekiel on that. So it says, the lion as the king of beasts and the eagle as the king of birds fittingly represented the empire of Babylon at the height of its glory. A lion is noted for its strength, whereas the eagle is famous for the power and the range of its flight. So it was strong and fast, right? Nebuchadnezzar's power was felt not only in Babylon, but from the Mediterranean to the Persian Gulf and from Asia Minor to Egypt. Thus, it is fitting in order to represent the spread of Babylon's power, and the lion should be provided with eagle wings. Okay, verse 7. They are terrible and dreadful, and their judgment and their dignity shall precede themselves. So their judgment means so strong and self-confident were the Chaldeans that they acknowledged no power but their own, crediting their grand attainments to their own abilities. We uh, see some examples of this in Daniel 4, 28 to 30. And it says, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon and the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of majesty? No. I, didn't, didn't he do that after God warned him not to? <laughs> for, for me, the, um, as we begun to unpack this particular chapter, uh, here we have a situation where God is saying, for, for wickedness, there is punishment. Yeah. A. And then God says, and I am going to send you a punishment that is worse than whatever you ever did in the past. Yeah. 
But the beauty about every single punishment pro pro promise in the Bible, whatever the book is, is that somebody else does it on God's behalf. Yeah. Somebody else. Yeah. It's either the Assyrians or the Babylonians yeah. or the Egyptians yeah. or exactly. Yeah. And, and what, in my personal opinion as I study this, I really look at this and I'm saying, do you really think you want to be as bad as bad there as as there is bad around? Yeah. If you do, let me show you what bad is all about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And in doing that, he's he gets the attention of the remnant. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what's more, um, what he's really passing on is judgment. He isn't really persecuting or destroying or removing yeah. he allows wickedness that's right to do so that's right what a god yeah that's right yeah if you run away from me long enough sooner sooner or later i'm just gonna like remove the barrier and let it come in yeah because the wickedness is out there yeah Satan yeah. must be work so hard to, uh, to judah on judah on israel oh he works on yeah I for sure he always works on god's people the hardest <laughs> absolutely all right so verse eight their horses are also are swifter than the leopards and they're more fierce than the evening wolves so the word leopards there it's indicating the swiftness of the leopard in catching his prey and um Example of that, Daniel 7, 6 says, After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had the, upon the back of it four wings as a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and a dominion was given it. So it was indicating its swiftness. And then the evening wolves, or evening jackals, these animals are the most fierce at night when they are prowling around for food. So an example there, Jeremiah 5, 6, Wherefore, a lion... A lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities, and every one that goeth out hence shall be torn to pieces, because their transgressions are many and their backslidings are increased. Right? So again, the punishment is coming because of apostasy. And Zephaniah 3.3 3 says, Her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves, and they gnaw not the bones till the morrow. What do you think that means? Right, so their, their evil is so, so rapacious, if I can use that word. Um, they're so, it's so, you know, intent and, you know, what they want to do that they don't stop and, like, an animal that is, just going around and killing, th killing things without taking the time to eat it. So it's doing it without the necessity for food. It's doing it because it's its evil intent is really what it's saying there. Okay, so um, their horsemen shall spread them. Uh, the context favors the Septuagint reading, ride forth, and that is to advance or to conquer. Um, and then eagle, we had talked about that. It's uh, the Hebrew word nesher, or a vulture, or an eagle. Moses had prophesied that if Israel turned away from God, the people would be punished for their sins by a nation with horses so swift that they are fittingly compared to eagles. So Moses prophesied of this all the way back in Deuteronomy, you know, bef before, um, you know, as they were coming out of the uh, out of uh, Egypt. So this was, they knew this prophecy like long before. So Deuteronomy 28, 47 to 50 says, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until ye have, been dis have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue 
thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor shew favor to the young. This is a stern warning, right? If you don't, if you don't love the Lord, he will send to you what, what it is you love. And that's a, that's a sad thing, is that it's our choice, right? Verse 9 says, uh, Thou shalt come for all for violence. Um, so violence there, previously mentioned, it will now be a punishment inflicted upon Judah by the Chaldeans. And their faces shall sup up as the east wind. So that word sup up, it's a little bit, you know, kind of a different word. And it's like Hebrew megamoth is the, the word that says to make something more powerful. And then when you talk about the east wind, this is um, translated as eastward. And it's often talking about um, judgment and destruction. Uh, so an example in Jeremiah 4.11, it's a dry wind. There, it says, because of its violence, its heat, and its excessive dryness, a dry, hot, and east wind blowing in from the desert was the climatic curse of the country. Hosea 13, 15 says, though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. And in Psalm 78, 26, it says, He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he brought in the south wind. Okay, so it's meaningful of destruction. And then it says, um, as the sand, that verse said, um, gather the captivity as the sand. It's a figure indicating the large number of prisoners and the spoils that would be taken this quite naturally agrees with the previous figure of the dreaded east wind with its columns and wind-blown sand. So it, it's very interesting that, you know, God told Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the sand of the sea, right? So you couldn't count them. And now here they're going into captivity, which they were forewarned about, and the capti captives are going to be as numerous as the sand. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay, verse 10, and they shall scoff at the king. So scoff is from the heights of their own self-esteem. The Babylonians would look down on and laugh at foreign kings and princes. That's how much they trusted in their own power. And then they will heap dust. That's an allusion to the making of a mound or an embankment of earth to attack a city. So for example, in 2 Samuel 20:15. We read that, and they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah, and they cast up a bank against the city, and it stood in the trench, and all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Have you ever seen the ramp that the Romans built against Masada? You know, that's yes. a good example. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Okay, number 11. Now, the, uh, this was very interesting to me. It says, then, then the tide shifts for this this kingdom that is right gonna come against him it says then shall his mind change and he pass over and offend so pass over there is meaning either to pass on or proceed forward through the land or to pass all bounds of pride does it come to a point where pride passes its bound and you and and god can no longer reconcile that person to the unpardonable sin. Yeah. When your own mind cannot be reprogrammed, yeah. you've got it. You're done. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then it says, and they will offend, imputing his power onto his God. So it says, God is offended because the Babylonians attribute their success to their own strength and skill, making their own might their God. The prophet implies that the nation that is used to punish Judah will itself be punished for its own sins. Um, okay, so who was it that imputed his power to his God? Who is it, who is it on the Babylonians that passed over in pride? 
No, Nebuchadnezzar repented. He repented, and I hope to have dinner with him in heaven. Um, but Belshazzar. Belshazzar. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So let's read Daniel five one to four. This is bring it to memory for us. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousands. And while he tasted the wine. Command, he commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem that the king and his princes, his concubines, might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which is at Jerusalem and the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, brass, iron, wood, and of stone. All right. So this act of pride sealed the destruction of Belshazzar and the nation of Babylon. Right. So it's interesting how God prophesied even the fall of Babylon there and in that way. Okay. Oh, the same message that we have today. I mean, we have to be ready for his second coming. Is, you know, is a warning to us. For us to be ready is the same way mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, very briefly, it's, th this passage is very interesting mm -hmm. because in the wickedness <laughs> of the hour, they worship the gods that they created. Yes. In other words, the way they're worshiping themselves. Yes, they were. Yeah, and what do we remember happened in that hour? Uh, and handwriting on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the destruction fell very quickly Absolutely. after that. Absolutely. Okay, so the next section, verse 12 through chapter 2 1, it's the prophet's second question. So he started with having this burden and questioning God why all this violence. God answers and said what he's going to do. Now the prophet has another question. All right. Byron, you want to read this for me, 12 through 17, please? Oh, sure. I'm going to brush up on my old English. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he, and maketh men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with and uh, with the angle. They catch them in the net and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net, and burn incense unto their drag, because they them their portion is fat, and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net, and not spare continually to slay the nations? In chapter two, verse one. Oh boy, okay. I will stand upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Okay. All right, so when, when Habakkuk perceived what God was about to do, how was he affected? What was his response? Well, first of all, he says, God, are you not the one from everlasting? That's exactly, that's exactly <laughs> Aren't you is. my holy one? Basically, he said, why would you do this to Judah? <laughs> exactly. exactly. You know what? You look at scripture. How was Jesus the most yeah. stern with? The scribes and the Pharisees. Right. right. Yeah. Why was he so stern with them? Because that's they the only thing heart. they could hear. Yeah. Judah has gone so far down the path of apostasy, a powerful slap in the face and possibly some maiming and things like that are the only thing that will get their attention at this point. That's right. 
sadly to say, but that's right. Well, yeah. it's happened before Noah. That's why mm -hmm. Noah built yeah. the ark. And Noah preached to people what did they hear. It, it, it happened every time that God brought judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, the, the, the last one is going to be on us. I mean, the second coming. Yeah. Well, and you look, it said with Israel, they were as bad as the antediluvians, right? Yeah. Every thought was evil. Yeah. The Assyrians, definitely every thought was evil. Yeah. The Babylonians are getting there. Yeah. But they're not quite there yet. They're still useful. So it's, it's interesting, cause, you know, because... God says, um, whom I love, I chastise, right? And so, you know, it was necessary. Um, and, it, and it's interesting how, you know, even, even the ten tribes of Israel, he allowed, he allowed punishment to come time and time again, but he did not, he did not give them up until their apostasy was so great that they were they were beyond reconciliation, right. yeah. and then he said, "I have to give you up." Right. right. And, and verse, thir sorry, verse thirteen here is is a very interesting statement made by a prophet about a God who cannot stand iniquity, yeah. whose eyes are pure. Yes. And he says, "In this judgment thing, God, how are you going to look at them yes. when you cannot stand yes. iniquity?" That's right. It's a very interesting and provoking statement that it's so true of a God that is just righteous, yeah. pure, holy. Yeah. No, that's right. Because, you know, God God loves us more than we love our own children. That's exactly. And so he, he's saying not only how can you look on this evil, exactly. but it's being done to your son. Exactly. How could you do that? That's right? Exactly. That's what he's saying. Yeah, because my son's so bad, he needs it. Yeah, sometimes you look at Nebuchadnezzar, whatever yeah. king he put in last or installed, um, I forgot his name, but he basically was so upset with them that he has three his three sons put before him, has all three of them killed, and then gouges his eyes out. So the last thing he sees is his children yes. perishing. I'm like, that's pretty cold blooded. That's that, for that sure. is, yeah, <laughs> you're right. That is punishment for the highest Yeah, degree. it is. Okay, so it says, this reply creates a new and greater difficulty for Habakkuk and leads to his second complaint. For how can God possibly use such a wicked people as an instrument of his purpose? The eyes of the Holy One, the ever-living God, are too pure to behold evil and to look on wrong. Why then does he look on with apparent indifference while the ruthless Chaldeans swallow up a people more righteous than themselves? For like fish caught on a fisherman's net, the Judeans are trapped by the conqueror who is dealing mercilessly with them as with other nations. Mm -hmm. Just one quick comment. Yeah. But Judah knows better. Nebuchadnezzar is still in darkness to a yeah. degree. So actually, I think the prophet has it wrong because they are... The, the Judah, they actually are more, they know the truth and they snub it. Yes. Rather than being ignorant, they actually are more guilty. You, you bring up a very good point. And that, that's why in verse 2, verse 1, he says, okay, I'm going to stand on my tower now and wait to be reproved. Yes. Right? <laughs> that's exactly. That's exactly. You know, this is a war between God and Satan. Yes, it is. Yeah. Absolutely, it is. How and, many and, prophets and, do and, just that? I'm yes. going to stand on the top. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be yeah, I, I, I answered I God, and he's not going to answer me back. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right, so unable to see the answer to this perplexing problem, Habakkuk retires to brood over it. I will stand, take my stand to watch and station myself on the tower. Maybe the prophet is speaking literally, and the tower is a quiet and secluded place of retreat. More probably, the language is figurative. For us also, it may be necessary to withdraw from activity for a time in order to see life and its problems in perspective. As from the top of a high tower, one can see the landscape as a whole. So a clearer and larger vision may be given to the man who ascends the hill of the Lord. 
He reveals himself to those who wait upon him with eager expectancy. For the Christian, the tower has various names, private prayer, public worship, Bible reading and meditation, the quiet time, and the occasional retreat. Right? All right, so verse 12, going back to kind of starting this section, it says, Art thou not from everlasting? Habakkuk is speaking for his people and appeals to God for mercy that they do not perish. Looking beyond the forbidding prospects of the present, the prophet affirms in faith, we shall not die. And then he talks to them, thou hast ordained them for judgment. Here he uses a sense of punishment. And then using the title, Almighty God, that's the Hebrew sir or rock. This title emphasizes the thought that God is a sure and unmoved support for his people. The final clause of the Hebrew text quoted in the Habakkuk commentary of the Dead Sea Scroll reads, O rock, as one chastising him, thou ordained him. Right? So they, they have this, as, as God's chosen people, they have this perception that God is their rock no matter how much they apostatize and how long they do that, right? That they have inherent, because they are Abraham's children, God is going to protect them. Was that, was that arrogant on their part to believe that? Presumption? It was presumption, yeah. I think presumption is probably more correct because, after all, God picks them up, chooses them, yep. embraces them. You're now my people. You're the small little little tribe. I'm going to yeah. make you bigger than any. Yeah. That sort of a thing. And, um, and, 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 and you see after decade and decade and decade of, of wickedness and, and sinfulness, that constant love, that constant desire to bring you back. Yeah. And you sort of wonder at the end of the day, um, the prophets probably wonder, I would wonder, well, what is God going to do to really bring them back to the fall? Yeah. Rather than, is God really going to destroy them? Yeah. They're definitely ignoring the Deuteronomy where it's, they told time and time again, if you obey, I will bless you. If you yep. obey, I will bless you. If you obey, I will yep. bless you. It wasn't just once. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do it. Let's bring it to today. Okay. We're Seven Day Adventists. We have the truth. We go to church on Sabbath. <laughs> yes, we do. We do this and that. Oh, we got. We're covered. Yeah. We're solid. <laughs> but are you really have that relationship with God? Are you keep getting closer and closer? Have you plateaued? Have you even backslid a little? Yeah. yeah. They don't even believe what prophets say. What prophets yeah. tell them? Habakkuk, who is at the Nehemiah? Yeah. Or all the prophets, they, you know, telling them, give them warning. They don't yeah. believe it. They're so prideful. No, we love God love us. Yeah, yeah. All right, so Deuteronomy 32, 31, going back to the word, the rock, it says, for their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges, right? So they recognize that they trusted in the true rock who could protect them. And then in 2 Samuel 22, it says, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. Right. So they had, they had this trust, but then like I think, you know, like you said, they presumed too much. You know, and, and aren't we sometimes that way in terms of, you know, God is so eager to bless us, but sometimes the blessings are too much for our human hearts to handle. And we get, we get uh, distracted or, or we get numb to the fact that God is asking us to do, you know, to live by his standards. And we kind of say, ah, oh, you know, well, I'm just going to let a little of this from the world come in or this or that or do this to do this practice. And sooner or later, it, it leads to full-out apostasy. Well, and the danger of it is also, if you know you're not supposed to do something, and you do it, then you ask for forgiveness, right? Yeah. And then you maybe do it again, and then you ask for forgiveness. You're like, I'm okay, God will forgive me. Yeah. And you can play that game where yeah. it's like a dog chasing his tail. Yeah. But 
if you don't grow, you won't realize what God has in store for you. Yeah. If you stay chasing your tail in a circle That's all right. day long. That's right. And how how many how many um, unrealized you know opportunities do we have in our life because we've we've gone down that path, right? You know. Yeah, me too. Trust me, me too. Um, so we're going to read Ellen White, Prophets and Kings there. Um, it's, it says, Inquiry of Habakkuk about the fall of Judah. That's the title of this section. It says, At the time Josiah began to rule, and for many years before, the true-hearted in Judah were questioning whether God's promises to ancient Israel could ever be fulfilled. From a human point of view, the divine purpose for the chosen nation seemed almost impossible of accomplishment. The apostasy of former centuries had gathered strength with the passing years. Ten of the tribes had been scattered among the heathen. Only the tribes of Judah and Benjamin remained, and even these now seemed to be on the verge of moral and national ruin. The prophets had begun to foretell the utter destruction of their fair city. Where stood the temple built by Solomon, and where all their earthly hopes of national greatness had centered? Could it be that God was about to turn aside from his avowed purpose of bringing deliverance to those who should put their trust in him? In the face of the long-continued persecution of the righteous and of the apparent prosperity of the wicked, could those who had remained true to God hope for better days? These anxious questionings were voiced by the prophet Habakkuk. Viewing the situation of the faithful in his day, he expressed the burden of his heart in the inquiry. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry unto, out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are those that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. God answered the cry of his loyal children. Through his chosen mouthpiece, he revealed his determination to bring chastisement upon the nation that had turned from him to serve the gods of the heathen. Within the lifetime of some who were even then making inquiry regarding the future, he would miraculously shape the affairs of the ruling nations of earth and bring the Babylonians into the ascendancy. These Chaldeans, terrible and dreadful, were to fall suddenly upon the land of Judah, and the fairest of the people were to be carried captive to Babylon. The Judean cities and villages and the cultivated fields were to be laid waste. Nothing was to be spared. Okay, so what lessons can we learn from this description of Habakkuk's prophecy and the mindset of the prophet and God's people, and how does that relate to us today? As the same sin. We inherit the same sin. And yeah. We yeah. Yeah, for most of the, the Christian world today, um, you know, even even though you know they may call or we can include ourselves in there, call call ourselves Christians, do are we really are we really followers of Christ? Because a follow, if you're a follower of Christ, Christ was here to reveal the Father, and to obey his will. He was in complete submission to that. That is what a follower of Christ is. How many times do we do or say something, and if you stopped and thought, could I picture Jesus doing that? Yeah. We might not end up as well as we might think. Yeah, I think you're right. And, 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 and I, I really like this passage of Scripture. Uh, this uh, Ellen White's uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it, I really the prophet like that yeah. because yeah. because I, I I take us into last years in this world history. Yeah, 
where we are going to begin to become a lot more bombarded with, with uh, pain and despair and affliction and yeah. everything else that goes on. Yeah. Uh, and what is the reaction? What is the reaction? How do we, how do we really handle day-to-day -day activities? And the crucible that seems to ever being increased. Yeah. And and I think um, and I, I think one needs needs to, to look at God through the eyes of faith, through 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 the experience of the past, and say, God told me that the crucible the, the crucible was going to be extremely hard. Why do I believe that? Mm -hmm. But he also told me, believe, trust, have faith in me, hold on to my strength. Mm -hmm. I'm coming soon. That's right. That's right. Yeah. These God, are real issues. Those are real issues. And and God is God has been consistent all the way through. Right? right? If if you believe I am your rock and your strength, your high tower, right? if you believe and follow. But if you are intent on going your own way, at some point I have to give you up to that. That's it. And, and that will be for your own good because I want to draw you back, mm -hmm. right? But at some point, if you continue to, you know, rebel against that, yeah. I'll give you up and you won't come back, right? And that's, that's true from the beginning of time all the way through the end. Okay, so verse 13 said, Thou art of purer eyes. So that's, um, since the sinless nature of God cannot tolerate evil and cannot countenance iniquity, the prophet is perplexed as to why God would permit the Chaldeans to deal treacherously against his people. They are idolaters and far wor worse, at least from Habakkuk's point of view, than Judah. So the, how then can God in justice use them to punish Judah? Psalms 5, 4 to 6 says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all works of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and the deceitful man. And Psalms 145, 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his way and holy in all his works. Um, and so when he says the man that is more righteous than he, saying he's talking about comparing Judah to the wicked, right? Uh, verse 14, and make us men as fishes of the sea. Okay, so the righteous man is often as dumb and helpless under a wicked oppressor as fish are in the nets of fishermen. You know, and, and that's the thing, is when you become a captive to another nation, are you at that point able to make your own choices? No, your your you you really have to. Your freedom's gone. Yeah, they they may give you a perception of freedom that allows you to go on the leash as long as they're leashes, but if you try to go beyond that leash, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's not going to go well for you. All right, so they're so creeping things. Um, Psalms. 104, 25 says, So is this great and wide sea wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and beasts. So he's equating, equating them to, um, you know, really, you know, fishes and creeping things are really things that they don't, they, for, first of all, they're, they're not that bright. Like, they don't have a lot of intelligence. And they're kind of at the whim of, like, whatever happens to them, right? And especially if they're caught in a net. And then it says, as if they have no ruler. In the Habakkuk commentary of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this last clause reads, as a crawling thing over which to rule. Genesis 1.26 says, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So they were going to become these things that God created that man was supposed to be a steward over, right? And now the role is reversed. Um, verse 15, they take up all of them with the angle. 
So it says, they literally being he, that is the wicked man, take up. Here the prophet shows figuratively how the Babylonians conquer nations. The fishing tackle represents the Chaldean armies. However, the same figure could represent the activity of any wicked person. Um, verse 16, they sacrifice into their net. Literally, he sacrifices a metaphorical way of indicating that the Chaldeans did not acknowledge a true God, but credited their success to their own skillful means. And then in verse 17, um, they therefore shall empty their nets. Um, we ta already talked about they, it's talking about the wicked, empty their nets. The prophet asks whether the Chaldeans shall be allowed to go on conquering to continue to empty their net, only to refill it again with the spoils of war. In verse 17, the Hebrew text quotes the Habakkuk commentary of the Dead Sea Scroll and reads, he shall therefore draw his sword continually to slay nations without showing mercy. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were, they were a ravenous, um, you know, hateful group, evil group of people you know, and they were never filled by the conquering of nations. They always wanted more, right? Go ahead. So another analogy on this, perhaps Judah had gotten so bad that God viewed them as dumb beasts. Well, there's a good question, but yeah. And if he's like, if you're going to act like dumb beasts, I'm going to treat you like dumb beasts. And even the heathens act more like human beings than you do, I'm going to give them dominion over you. Yeah. And let you be treated as you act. That's Maybe. interesting. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Well, mm -hmm. you, you know, I think... I, I like Byron's, Byron's uh, example. I, I, I really look at it in, 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 in a different way somewhat. Mm -hmm. I, I look at God's people, and who's God's people? Everyone who has accepted him, or everyone who has chosen to follow mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Mm -hmm. So if God's people and God really saying, if you follow my instruction and you love me mm -hmm. and you abide with me, this is the experience. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you are going to really rip the, the, the benefit of your own journey yeah. by yourself. And in reality, this is what is happening. And, and it's ha it, it happens, it, and right now with, uh, with, with in this particular book of the Bible, we're concentrating on is on Judah, mm -hmm. which really to a certain extent was a little better towards God than the ten tribes of Israel, yeah, which had really been removed and taken out. Yeah. So we really at that phase in history where Judah should be look, looking up and saying, look what happened yeah. to our brothers and sisters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we already are invaded mm -hmm. by these Babylonians. Mm -hmm. What should we be doing? Mm -hmm. And yet it, it doesn't seem as if that has penetrated the mind. That's right. Yeah. And I, I, I therefore look at this and, and say, this is of course not, not God's issue. This is... The heart issue. The heart issue. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's such an issue that they have no full knowledge and understanding of God and who God was. Mm -hmm. Because they had difficulty in making choices. Yeah. And I was just bouncing back to the dumb animal. But God wants to snap them out of it <laughs> yeah. and bring them back to yeah. being exactly. his people. Exactly. Yeah. But at that moment, they're kind of in a really bad headspace. They are. <laughs> they are. Yeah. And bad heart space. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> by, by learning this, are we better? Are we know God better than Yeah. Them? I'm definitely more, afraid, I'm more worried about what God thinks of me than Judah. But, yes. but, but, but your question is really the question for all of us today. Exactly. How, when you look at Israel and you look at Judah, what do you see? 
when that reflection of the mirror comes to you, what do you see in you? Yeah. That is the question. Yeah. This is the lesson for us, for the, for yes. the kingdom. Yeah. To be able to, to, to cross the Jordan, yes. to make it to Canada. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So um, going on, it says, okay, so although Habakkuk was perplexed by this, what shows that he had faith in the ultimate justice? So this goes back to how we opened up chapter two. He goes, I'm going to stand on my watch and set up my tower and then watch and see. And then when I'm reproved, I will answer. So that word to stand there, Habakkuk here clearly demonstrates his faith in God. He represents himself as taking his position, as does a watchman, on some high place in order to get a clear view all around what he may see and hear what is coming. And that tower there, it's a stronghold that is a place from which to withstand a siege. In the Hebrew text quoted in the commentary of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this word has a suffix meaning my. And he's going to watch and see. So he feels sure that he has confronted God with a valid objection to his plan to use the Chaldeans of his instrument against Judah. And so he accordingly waits for an answer. And then that part, when I am reproved, it says rather concerning my objection or concerning my reproof. Okay, so let's go on. The next section is talking about then the just shall live by faith. So God had talked a lot about the apostates within Judah and what was coming for them, but he doesn't forget the remnant. So he now addresses that, right? So let's read verses 2 through 4. Victor, you want to read that for me, please? Yeah. All right. Verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain upon table, take the table, tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Okay, so what assurance is God giving Habakkuk here? Right? Habakkuk paused to listen to God, and now God is responding and he gives him assurance, right? So it says, while in this attitude of quiet and hopeful receptivity, Habakkuk receives in a vision the message for which he waits. He is commanded to write it on tablets in large characters so that even a runner may read it. There are two reasons why it is to be put in writing. Intended for all, it must be available for all to see. Furthermore, the written word is the pledge of a reality not yet manifested. The prophet is told to wait patiently for the fulfillment of the divine word, which has its own inherent power and energy. The revelation is couched in the following words. Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by his faithfulness. Amen. You know, and, and so for these prophets that had to, you know, pronounce such doom and judgment on God's people, I mean, that could not have been a comfortable thing to have to do. And as, you know, as we opened it up, it says it was such a burden on, um, on Habakkuk, what was going on, and just, you know, and then when he hears a response, he goes, oh, no, not that, you know. So th it's not like this was easy for them to do this. Um, and judgment was coming to God's people, not just to the wicked, but to all all were impacted. They were all taken into captivity, right? And so God was going to send a special message to those who still had their ear listening to him, including Habakkuk, to say, wait for it. It may seem to tarry. Wait for it. But basically, you know, I'm there. I'm still your rock and your salvation. 
and it will come. Your salvation will come. And what a promise that is. And those verses really kind of says, I'm going to clean house in Judah. Yeah. So if you're righteous, trust by faith. Yeah. But I'm going to take a lot of those that are a problem that have passed the point of no return. I'm going to take care of business. Yeah. And I'm using the Babylonians to do it. That's right. That's, that's absolutely because right. Because you think about when they come back after the 70 years, right? Yeah. They not come back, and back. Not all of them come back, but they come back and they're faithful to God. There was that remnant. Yeah, there was. Yeah. Okay, uh, verse 2 says, The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision upon the tables, um, that he may run who readeth it. So the Lord answers the faith of his servant and encourages him in his work. Writing would give permanence to the prophet's message. And then on tables, that's Hebrew lukoth, usually stone tablets, sometimes wooden boards. Here, these were probably tablets placed in public places where all could see and read them. And then it says, may run. The Hebrew word roots, it's the clause reads literally, so that the reader of it may run, that is to run swiftly or to dart or to cause to run away. Um, and then in verse 3, it says, The vision is yet for an appointed time. That literally is the vision will be filled in due time. Right. Galatians 4, 4 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. God always does things in his perfect time. Even for us, it seems like it tarries. It's always in God's perfect time. Um, and then it's, uh, it says, at the end it shall speak. Um, that word is from the Hebrew pak, pak, which is to breathe or to blow. Um, the clause may be translated, it panteth. And, it's a, and then when it says, it, though it tarry, the last clause there says, though he shall tarry, wait for him, for he will surely come and will not tarry. According to the reading of the Hebrew, even though the fulfillment of the vision concerning the coming of the Chaldean conquerors should seem to be laid, delayed, in due course it would be fulfilled. According to the reading of the Septuagint, the idea seems to be that even though the enemy should seem to tarry, he would surely come as predicted. The reading of the Septuagint is alluded to in Hebrew 1037, and the words along with a phrase um, from Isaiah 2620 are applied in the second advent of our Lord. So Hebrews 1037 says, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And Isaiah 2620 says, come my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee, Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is overpassed. It's a very comforting verse. It is. Oh, well, you yeah. kept asking, how long, Lord? He's like, wait for yeah. it. Wait for it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, it talks about um, the early, because this was very important to the early Advent believers. This is, you know, after the great disappointment, this was really important for them to claim this promise, knowing that the Lord, if he gives a promise, it's true and sure. So the prophecy of Habakkuk was a source of great encouragement and comfort to early Advent believers known as the Millerites. When the Lord did not appear in the spring of 1844 as first expected, the Millerites were thrown into deep perplexity. It was shortly after the initial disappointment that they saw special significance in the words of the prophet the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. They rested upon the language of prophet and went forth to proclaim the midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. So we have much to still uh, look forward to because it, sometimes it seems that we've been on this planet for a long time and it's been... 180 years since the great disappointment, right? We, 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 we really need to benefit from 
everything that has gone before us. Yeah. You know, that's right. um, a little while ago, as we were talking about this, my mind went to Noah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here we are looking at Habakkuk. Mm -hmm. How is Habakkuk facing this situation? Well, how, how did Noah face this situation? Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Noah had no precedent to look into. Mm. It was a matter of accepting God's word and doing it by faith. Yeah. 120 years go by. I wonder if he ever sort of asked the question, is this going to ever happen? Yeah. Is it really going to rain? Yeah. Is this going to really rain? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and so, the, the, you know what? The more I study scripture, the more I read the Bible, the more I know that God is so merciful. And the reason for that is that I'm no different than any other sinner. Yeah. I'm just a sinner like all they are. Yeah. And therefore, punishment for my sin is justified. Yeah. But here's a God who's really being merciful yeah. and patient yeah. and generous. Yeah. And it's, it's just the way it yeah. is. It is. You know, by learning all this, since we have the, all these lessons for us, our faith should be better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our relationship with God should be, you know, because we know the promise. We see all the history. When mm -hmm. God says things, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and even though it takes a while sometimes, he doesn't leave you hanging. Even with Noah, right. there was Methuselah that preached. That's there was right. the animals that came to the ark after that. Right. The certain lineup came to God. Okay, God, you got it. That's right. Right. So That's God, right. he might have those moments of doubt, even when John the Baptist doubted. And they came to Jesus, he goes, tell John what you see, the blind see, exactly. the deaf hear, and all these other things that comforted him. So even when he had a moment of doubt, God's like, I got you. Yeah, that's, exactly right. that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all right. So it says, behold his soul which is lifted up. So for the first half of the verse, uh, the Septuagint reads, if he should draw back, my soul has no pleasure in him a reading which appears in Hebrews 10.38. It is interesting to note that the Hebrew text quoted in the Habakkuk commentary of the Dead Sea Scrolls is in agreement with the Masoretic text in this instance. In their primary application, these words reprove the prophet for his rashness and lack of faith. Um, and then, you know, the end of the statement, the just shall live by faith. Uh, the just or the Hebrew sadiq, uh, which is righteous or guiltless or just, is used to reference to a person or thing examined and found in good condition. This closing clause sets forth the character of the good man as opposed to that of the evil man described in the first part of the verse. And then faith, Hebrew, amna, constancy or reliability or faithfulness, used here to describe one's relation to God. Trust in God issues forth from the assurance that God will guide, protect, and bless those who will do his will. Habakkuk here grandly affirms that he who lives by a simple faith and trust in the Lord will be saved, but the soul which is lifted up through its own willful pride and perverseness in sin will perish. Amen. Where the Masoretic text reads, his faithfulness, the Septuagint reads, my faithfulness, God himself being the speaker. In the quotation of this text found in Hebrew 10.38, comparatively, a uh, few New Testament manuscripts follow the Septuagint, whereas the majority of the manuscripts have neither his nor my modifying faith. The readings of both the Masoretic text and the Septuagint are based on great truths for a person will live, accepted in the sight of God by his trusting faithfulness to his God, which in turn is based on God's faithfulness in his dealings with his children. It is likely that this variation in the readings is due to the similarity in form of the Hebrew letters Wa and Yod as written during the time of the translation. Um, as written in that period, these letters appear practically identical, uh, used as suffixes of emna. Wa would mean his and Yod, my. Okay. So there's a lot of um, um, translation context there. 
While primarily this verse refers to those who, because of their faith in the Lord, will be saved from the Chaldeans and will still find peace, though Judah be destroyed, in a larger sense, the verse enunciates a truth that is applicable to all time. More than once, Paul employs this Old Testament declaration as the theme of a dissertation on righteousness by faith. So, for example, Romans 1, 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And in Galatians 3.11, he writes, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And Hebrews 10.38 and 39 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of that that believe to the saving of the soul. Okay, so let's um, go ahead and read some more of the Prophets and Kings from Ellen White. Could I convince someone to read for me? Sure, because that's 387 and 88? That's correct. Okay. The just shall live by his faith, the faith that strengthened Habakkuk, and all the holy and the just of those days of deep trial is the same faith that sustains God's people today. And the darkest hours, under circumstances the most forbidding, the Christian believer may keep his soul stayed upon the source of all light and power. Day by day, through faith in God, his hope and courage may be renewed. The just shall live by his faith. In the service of God, there need be no despondency, no wavering, no fear. The Lord is more than fulfillment, the highest expectations of those who put their trust in him. He will give them the wisdom their very necessities demand. Of the abundant provision made for every tempted soul, the Apostle Paul bears eloquent testimony. To him was given the divine assurance, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In gratitude and defiance, the tried servant of God responded, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmity, infirmaries, infirmities, sorry, um, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I or then am I strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. We must cherish and cultivate the faith of which prophets and apostles have testified. The faith that lays hold of the promises of God and waits for deliverance in His appointed time and way. The sure word of prophecy will meet its final fulfillment in the glorious advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As, kings, as King of kings and Lord of lords, the time of waiting may seem long. The soul may be oppressed by discouraging circumstances. Many in whom confidence has been placed may fall by the way. But with the prophet who endeavored to encourage Judah in a time of unparalleled apostasy, let us confidently declare, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Habakkuk 2.20 Let us ever hold in remembrance the cheering uh, uh, message. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Through, or though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The just shall live by his faith. Okay. Great. Um, what a promise, huh? That's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. beautiful. Beautifully written, beautiful promise. Absolutely. And well, if, we, it, mm -hmm. if we can't count on God's word, we're all wasting our time. It's, it's well, that is for sure. Uh, you know, and it, it just always, um, 
I don't know, it, it always humbles me when I read the words of Paul and he says, mm -hmm. I take pleasure in mm -hmm. infirmities and persecutions and this and that. I'm like, I don't. <laughs> and I'm just amazed at him. You don't you know? yet. Well, maybe that's it, yeah. yeah. But um, to me, it's just like, that's such a, a giant of faith to get yes. to. And it's just like, I, I'm you know, just not there in my thinking. It's literally God put me in a bad position so I can be helpless and count on you to show who you are. Yeah. Yeah. But the difference between Paul and Jesus, Jesus crying to see the sin that the man made, you know, sure. and the cross oh, is a children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for him. But uh, Paul saying, what do you say that about Paul? He, he takes pleasures in his infirmities and his struggles and right. his persecutions. And, and, and the reason being is you're absolutely right, Byron, it's because because it 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 shows Christ right, right. In, in in bearing those with such grace you can only bear them with grace if you have Christ's grace and so it just exemplifies Christ and it's a testament and so that's why he has pleasures in them because at the end of the day he loved Christ more than anything right mm -hmm. so yeah. if if through his own infirmities he could show Christ more, he was willing to do it. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on and read uh, the rest of the chapter of chapter 2. Woe to the wicked. There's five woes here in chapter 2, verses 5 through 20. Okay, Victor, are you up for reading those? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Verse 5. Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth an own, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and he and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and keepeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not is how long and to him that loveth himself with thick clay shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them because thou hast spoiled many nations all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land of the city and of all that dwell therein woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house that he may set his nest on eye that he may be delivered from the power of evil thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and has sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and established a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves? For, for very vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and makes him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shameful glory. Drink thy also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land of the city, and of all the dwelling therein. 
What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it? The molten image and the teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth they reign to make dumb idols. Woe unto him that sat to the wood, awake to the dumb stone, arise. It shall teach, behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Okay. So in this passage, God is now turning the tables. That's exactly right. Yeah. And he's now showing his favor towards the remnant yeah. who are true to him. And what is he going to do to this, this conquering power? Gonna He's going to bring them to their knees, right? That's exactly right. And, and why is that? Because they trusted in their own power. They trusted in their own gods. They were violent and evil. They um, were not only intent on their own evil, but... It, it says here that he gives his neighbor drink and puts a bottle to him. That's meaning he's making others evil. Yeah. He's making others do the same thing, right? And so God is saying, because of all of this, I am going to stand up and judge on behalf of my remnant, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to move a little more quickly through some of this because of time. Um, so let's turn the page. All right, that, that word there, wine, the Hebrew text there is, it has, uh, it's hon, or it's power or wealth. Um, they use that in place of wine. Being proud, of course, is haughty. Having a desire um, is a, a man himself, or it's the seat of appetite. So it said he has the desire of hell. So that meaning that, you know, um, they're... They're appealing and, and to their own seat of emotions and their appetites versus submitting their will to God. Um, and that word hell there is used, um, Sheol, so you know we know that word, but it's as death, and it's represented figuratively as being insatiable. So Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. And that's the problem with evil, right? Evil continues to beget evil. Mm -hmm. That's a problem even for people. Right? Yeah. You say the one with the most toys wins. You've got to keep filling that that's void right. in you. Yeah. And unless you find God, you never can. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And Isaiah 5.14 says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoices rejoiceth shall descend into it right so there's a stern warning there um okay so king james sheol is translated to the as grave 31 times hell 31 times and the pit six times um and it appears to show that sheol was used as a figurative expression denoting the place where men go at death from a strictly Literal point of view, it may be equated with the grave, uh, but Bible writers employing the figure describe it as a place where the dead sleep together. Um, okay, so let's move on down. Um, I wanted to just point out here some of the very similar language in Revelation 18 when it discusses Babylon, that end time apostate political religio system um, it says, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Right? So um, not only are you, know, you apostate, but you're also causing others to be so as well. So that, that is one of the big woes um, in that passage. Um, so then it goes on to, you know, contrast with, with the remnant, it contrasts the evil. So it's talking about all these evil nations. 
It says, take up a parable against him. That's a taunting song. So the enemy shall employ the words Israel used to lament her calamity as a taunt against her. Um, and woe to him that increases which, that which is not his and laden himself with thick clay. That thick clay word, it's um, a bit occurs only here in the Old Testament and generally is considered to mean pledges. That is, garments or other things given as security for debts. In other words, the question is asked, how long will Babylon go on piling up the debts of right and justice it owes to subjugated people before these pledges will have to be redeemed through the wrathful retribution upon the inhabitants of Babylon? Um, okay, so verse 7 um, shall they not rise up suddenly? That shall bite thee. Okay, so those whom the Babylonians have wronged will rise up and attack them. Historically, it was the Medes and the Persians who plundered the Chaldeans and destroyed their empire. Um, and thou shalt be booty unto them, or plunder. Jeremiah 59 and 10 says, For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. And Chaldea shall be a spoil. All that spoil her shall be satisfied, saith the Lord. Um, so we'll skip over eight. Spoil thee is being in revenge. So all the remnant are going to be in revenge. Uh, verse 9 says, Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness. Literally, it's a gainer of evil gain for his house. Um, probably a reference to the Babylonian royal family or dynasty. Um, and so it says, Woe to them because they will be delivered from the power of evil. So it means here from calamity. So in other words, they gather all this stuff together and they think by doing that they are going to preserve themselves from evil and they're going to protect themselves because they have all this wealth. Well, we know that that's not how it ended up. Even, even Nebuchadnezzar built an obelisk to himself and that didn't work so well. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay, top of page 20. So God is represented as doing that which he does not restrain. God does not coerce the will. When evil men willfully choose to follow deception, he does not intervene. Since God is supreme, his refusal to restrain the forces of evil is often represented as though he directly sends the evil. An example may be found in the incident of the fiery servants. So according to that narrative as related by Moses, the Lord sent fiery servants among the people. That was in Numbers. However, these fiery serpents were not suddenly created or miraculously transported from another region for the occasion. They already infest, infested the wilderness area through which the children of Israel were traveling and would have been a source of real danger and the cause of frequent deaths had not God by miracles subdued these venomous reptiles. But when the people turned away from God, are against God who protected them from the many hazards of the desert. God simply withdrew his protection and the death was a result. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so then the warning comes to them, thou hast consulted shame and hast sinned against thy soul. The schemes of the Chaldean king to secure glory by cutting off many people ensured his own shame. Hebrews 8, 36 says, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me loveth death. Um, okay, let's move down into the, the next woe, verse 10. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood. Um, in this woe, condemnation rests upon the Babylonians because their power was built up through slaughter and iniquity. Babylon was enlarged and embellished by the spoils seized from the conquered nations. Although this verse primarily applies to Babylon, the truths herein are applicable at all times. Um, and then, behold, uh, the Lord of hosts. So that, that's a title for the Lord. And it's referencing there, it's the Lord of the army of the Lord and the whole creation. There's only one that fits that title, yeah, right? 
Yep. Yep. Um, and it says the people shall labor in the very fire. So that means all the buildings and fortresses the Babylonians erected through their despotic slave labor would finally only be fuel for the fire, and so shall they weary themselves for very vanity. Jeremiah 51.29 says, And the land shall tremble and sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. And so it will be at the end of time, right? All the great cities will be burned. They will just be fuel for a fire, right? Um, verse 14, it says, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. So here Habakkuk is reiterating a thought previously expressed by Isaiah, and the overthrow of Babylon is a type of the destruction of all wicked of the last day. Isaiah 11:9 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And as, if you remember in, in um, Daniel 2, what was the last kingdom to be that was going to come upon the scene? The it was going to be the mountain, the mountain of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. All right, and then, um, you know, it says, for then there's another woe, giving your neighbor the drink and putting their bottle to it. So, so it's better he that joineth thy wrath. Um, it, the Revised Standard Version reads, Woe to him who makes his neighbor's drink of the cup of his wrath. Like the man who gives drinks to his neighbor that he might take advantage of him, so the Chaldeans gave to their neighbors, and it is only fitting that they in turn should be made to drink of the cup of God's wrath. And we see the, the antitype of that in Revelation 14, 8 and 10, and it says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Okay. Um, it goes on to say in its woe that you are filled or satiated with shame for your glory, and you let thy foreskin be uncovered or be counted as uncircumcised. What were the uncircumcised to God's people? They were the pagans, right? Yes, they were not yep. the covenant people. Yep. Um, let's go down to page 22. Uh, there's a question asked in verse 18, what profiteth the graven image and the maker therein? So it's talking about all their idols. So the prophet ironically is <clears throat> inquires as to what would benefit the Chaldeans for their trust in their God. Psalms 115, 4 to 8 says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes that they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses that have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like them, so it is everyone that trusts in them. Isn't that like the fishes and the creeping things? <laughs> Opening up your mind to reality and say, so, so Victor, you've placed that God there every day. Yeah. As eyes cannot see, as ears cannot hear, as hands cannot do anything for you, why on earth did you create that? Yeah. Or as right. they say in Jersey, what's wrong with you? Yeah, <laughs> indeed. So the, the Lord closes this, and I tell you, this is... This is one of those uh, those hymns that I love, and we used to sing it, you know, years and years and years ago, and now you ha hardly ever hear it, but I love this, this hymn. But it says, the Lord is in his holy temple, let the earth keep silence before him. Maybe we can get our music team to have us sing it one Sabbath. Okay, um, so the Lord says um, he's in his holy temple. So Habakkuk challengingly sets forth the difference between the living majestic God and the vain lifeless idols. While the prophet may have been 
primarily in the mind, had in his mind the temple of Jerusalem as the earthly dwelling place of God. In a larger sense, he may have thought about God's temple in heaven. And because of the exalted majesty of God, all the earth as the subjects of the king of the universe are summoned to wait silently and humbly before him. Psalms 11.4 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. 1 Kings 8.27 says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built it. That was Solomon speaking that. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And all the earth is talking about everywhere, all men. And then when it says keep silence, that is not to presume a quest to question the wisdom of God in guiding the destiny of nations as Habakkuk had done. The language of this verse is sometimes appropriately applied to reverence in the house of God, though this was not the original intent. All right, prophets and kings. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, behold as if dependent on the will and the prowess of man, the shaping event seems, as a great degree, to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold above, behind, and through all the play, the counterplay of human interest, and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. All right, let's try to... Hmm? Very quickly. Yeah. So, the Assyrians were used to judge as a, as a vehicle against Israel, right? The throne of yep. the tribes. And then when their time was up, God had let the, the Babylonians be kept down by the Assyrians until their time was up. Then the Babylonians rise, mm -hmm conquer the Assyrians by God's will, yeah. and then God uses the Babylonians for Judah by his will. Nebuchadnezzar actually does come on board at least for a while, but the rest of the company, uh, country after that falls into apostasy, and then God uses the Medes. If you look at it, God controls everything, and he any does. illusion that we have that we're, I'm all this, yeah. you're just fooling yourself. It's true. God, God sets up kings and he takes them down. And that's no different today than it was then. Is exactly. that the reason why we don't have to be involved in government things? Like okay, you know? let's, let, let's pause that one and talk about that another time because yeah. I'm running short on time here. Um, chapter 3, Byron, would you run through um, verses 1 to 16 for me, please? Oh, boy. All right. Um, about Cook and his prayer trembleth at God's majesty and the confidence of his faith. Okay. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon um, Shig Shigion. I'll go with that. Um, o Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath remember mercy. God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Salah. His glory covers the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth, and beheld, and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Gushan and affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride upon thy horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made um, quite naked according to the oats of the tribes, even thy word, Salah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by, the deep utterance are um, the deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. 
The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows, they went and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march though the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundedst the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Salah. Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea of thine horses, through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered, at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Okay, so... Habakkuk here responds in, in great faith in the Lord, and, and then he starts to talk about the power and majesty of the Lord coming on behalf of the remnant and, and bringing a judgment against the, the conquering, cruel nation and um, judging in favor, judging the whole earth in favor, favor of his remnant. So there's, you know, um, there is... Um, in, in the prophecy, there's an application for, you know, the remnant of, of Judah and, and, and how they would be restored. But there's also there the application for the end time as well, right? right? And so, um, so Habakkuk is, um, he's, he's in awe of this power of the Lord. And, um, and he says that in your wrath you will remember mercy. And you'll, who's he going to remember mercy for? It's going to be for the remnant. Um, so let's go on to page 26 and come down and let's talk about his description of the Lord coming. It says in verse 4, His brightness was as a light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of the power. So these horns are rays which are flashing from his hands. And the hiding of power is referred to when the Savior appears, the wounds of Calvary, the tokens of his humiliation will appear as his highness, highest honor. There will be his glory there, the hiding of his power. Ellen White in Great Controversy writes, By the people of God, a voice clear and melodious is heard saying, Look up, and lifting their eyes to heaven, they behold the bow of promise. The black, angry clouds that had covered the firmament are parted, and like Stephen, they look up steadfastly into heaven, and they see the glory of God and the Son of Man seated upon his throne. In his divine form, they discern the marks of his humiliation, and from his lips they hear the request presented before his Father and the holy angels. I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Again, a voice musical and triumphant is heard saying, they come holy, harmless, and undefiled. Um, they have kept the word of my patience. They shall walk among the angels and the um, pale quivering lips of those who had held fast their faith utter a shout of victory. So this is talking about the very end time remnant. Um, before him is pestilence and burning coals. We read a, a lot about that in Revelation 2. Um, Habakkuk now sets forth the effect of the divine appearance upon the unrighteous. Pestilence will fall. In other words, destruction will come upon the wicked. And burning coals, that's a flame. Here it represents figuratively to mean a plague. Um, and in verse 6 it says he stood and measured the earth. Well, we know measuring the earth is a judgment. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. These are mountains are symbols of stability, and so which will be scattered at the time of the great event. We know that at the second coming of the Lord that the earth will convulse, you know, and it will be destroyed. And so these 
great symbols of stability that you know we look around in nature and we, we rely on, they literally will be um, convulsed and destroyed. Um, and that happens at the coming of the Lord. Um, going down to verse um, 9, let's talk about that. Thy bow, what, bow was quite naked. That means it's readied for action, right? It's no longer in its sheath right? It's ready for action. Um, according to Oath of the Tribes, that Hebrew passage is a bit obscure, um, has marked variations for translation, but the, the ASV reads, the bow, thy bow was made quite bare, the oaths to the tribes were a sure word, or thou didst strip the sheath from thy bow and put the arrows to the string. Um, Okay, let's go on. We're going to go on to page 28. Okay, let's talk about the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. So here the prophet is using the history of the sun and moon standing in the days of Joshua as an illustration of the coming of the Lord. And in verse... Um, um, 12, when it talks about thou didst thresh in the heathen in anger, it says, or tread the nations. And I, I left you some verses to go and read that, both from the Old and the New Testament. Um, and then in verse 3, it says, thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. And then at the end, of it says, by discovering the foundation onto the neck. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the Lord's coming is to save his people, his anointed people, and this, this term, you know, this phrase, unto the neck, is these words indicate that the house of the wicked will be completely destroyed, right? Comes up to the neck. <coughs> um, Thou didst strike through his staves the heads of villages and came out as a whirlwind. Isaiah 41, 16 says, Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. And Jeremiah 13, 24 says, Therefore I will scatter them as stubble that passeth away by the wind in the wilderness. Right? So whirlwind is a, a force of destruction. It says, Um... Thou didst walk through the sea. It's probably an allusion to the Exodus as a type of the latter divine deliverance of God's people. At the time of the Exodus, God led his people from Egypt by treading figuratively the surge of great waters. You see that in Psalms 77, which says, Thy way is in the sea and thy path in the great waters. Thy footsteps are not known. Thou ledest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Um, verse 16, it says, When I heard this, my belly or my whole nature trembled. All right, let's go on then. Uh, let's read the final verses, 17 through 19. Victor, you want to read those on page 29? Yep, absolutely. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, and the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in God, in the God of my salvation. And the Lord God is my strength, and he will make me feel like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer of my stringed, uh, stringed instruments yeah, to the that chief was, musician. Yeah, that was that reference to why they thought maybe he was a Warner. temple singer, right? So verse 17 talks about the, the destruction of all the cultivated Correct. areas, right? That is going to happen at, at the coming of this. And the fig tree there is, it represents baleful effects on the Babylonian invasion the destruction of the fig and olive trees, which were so highly prized in Palestine, along with all the equally needed vines, grain, and cattle. They will all be similarly um, desolated. He says, even though this is happening, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. So fearful as the events 
forebodes, it closes in the comforting and soul-satisfying note of joy and hope and salvation in the Lord. The prophet assures himself that ultimately all will be well because of the faithfulness of his God. The problem is solved, and the prophet gladly submits his own will to the will of God. And then in verse 19, he says, the Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet and make me to walk on high places. If you go to the back page, it says um, the hinds feet are, you know, those are those like those goats and those animals that walk around the, the, the rough crags very, you know, and on the mountains and they're very stable. So that's how he will be. And it will make me to walk. He identifies himself with his people. Um, and with Israel's success. <clears throat> and then f finally closes with upon mine high places. So God's people will triumph over all opposition and will dwell securely upon the heights of salvation. All the questions of the prophet are answered by faith in God and Habakkuk rests content that ultimately right and truth will triumph forevermore. Okay, so there we are. Wonderful. Wonderful study. Paul feels the way that he feels. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Fearful as are the events that this chapter forbades, it closes on the comforting and soul satisfying note of joy, hope, and salvation. Paul's yeah. life was an eternal life. Yes. Not a life here on earth. That's right. That is right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what an example for us. Yeah. That, you know, God can take someone who was going so far down the wrong path in his own thinking, just yeah. erred, and God could turn him around, and he was such a faithful servant of God. Right. Yeah, he can do that for all of us. All right, let's go ahead and close with prayer. I know everyone's tired. It's a long night, and... Uh, you know, we'll be back here in the morning. Yep. All right. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for preserving this book of Habakkuk and all the minor prophets. They've been such a tremendous testimony to us of your love and faithfulness. Lord, um, there's, you know, many warnings there, warnings that still apply to us today, to your people, to, to those who are pagan and heathen, Lord, you, you wish that all would turn to you and be saved. Lord, um, you know, we are here because we have faith and, and love for you. But Lord, it's imperfect, so we pray that you will strengthen us and make us perfect in you. And Lord, help us to be a, a living testimony, as Paul was, a living testimony that takes pleasure in whatever may come because of our faithfulness to you takes pleasure in that because it is a testimony of you. Father, forgive our sins and help us to honor you in our lives. I pray that you would, as you go uh, with us this Sabbath day, give us a good night of rest. Um, and, and I pray for your blessing upon our church tomorrow as we, we enter into this special time of prayer and fasting. May your Holy Spirit do the work of purification that is needed. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.